Hi, and welcome back. It's great to be back here again with yet another book review. Thanks for stopping by. I hope you had a good new year, and let's get right into it. This book is called The Myth of Mental Illness, Foundations of a Theory of Personal Conduct by Thomas Zaz, MD, and it came out in 1974. The book is 300 pages, which includes two appendices. Immediate thoughts on this book as I reflect on it was how shockingly relevant a lot of the themes being talked about here in this book. It has a preface, introduction, and then is divided into two parts. The myth of mental illness and the foundations of a theory of a personal conduct. Within the two parts are five subparts that are broken down into chapters, 15 of them. There's not only a conclusion, but an epilogue as well, and a summary. Indeed, this author wanted to close with multiple closing thoughts. Kind of like three exclamation points at the end of his goal in that, quote, My aim in this essay is to raise the question, is there such a thing as mental illness? And to argue that there is not. <clears throat> So before I get into this book review, I wanted to share with you a few thoughts and my interpretation of this work. I believe it has a lot to do with the enterprise of psychotherapy and its implications, both explicit and implicit. Things like legal, socioeconomical, political, and especially moral implications. It has a fair share of biblical connections as well, which is indeed interesting. More to do here about psychiatry being an apparatus of the government that is especially insidious, and I believe that there's a conflict of interest there, and it is being exploited under the guise of something that's authoritative in a respectful manner, but really it's more of a charade, and it's used as a method of manipulation and control. Say that the moral implications are a constant theme that persists in many of the things that we do as we go about our lives and live them under governments and societies as they try to guide us in how to act and conduct ourselves. It seems lately people want to have their cake and eat it too, that one thinks morality can be thrown away these days when then, and then lament when there's an absence of morality, when decisions and actions are made without its considerations. Morality has a lot more to do with life than you think, and the more you try to brush it off like it doesn't matter, the more you pay for it in consequences of either neglecting the ethics or willfully attempting to ignore them. But I digress. We can get right into it. Now we can dive into the preface. I'm going to start with Shakespeare. He brings up Shakespeare and brings up this, this kind of uh, passage that's fairly interesting. And again, this is in the preface. So he writes... The secularization of everyday life, and with it, the medicalization of the soul and of suffering of all kinds, begins in late 16th century England. Shakespeare's Macbeth came out in 1611 as a harbinger. Overcome by guilt for her murderous deeds, Lady Macbeth goes mad. She feels agitated and is anxious, unable to eat, sleep, or rest. Her behavior disturbs Macbeth, who sends for a doctor to cure his wife. The doctor arrives and quickly recognizes the source of Lady Macbeth's problem. So now it's time to read a little bit of Shakespeare for you. You're welcome. Doctor, to gentlewoman, go to, go to, you have known what you should not. Gentlewoman, she has spoke what she should not. I am sure of that. The doctor tries to reject Macbeth's effort to medicalize his wife's disturbance. Doctor, this disease is beyond my practice. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Infected minds to their death pillows will discharge their secrets. More needs she the divine than the physician. I think, but dare not speak. Macbeth rejects this diagnosis and demands that the doctor cure his wife. Shakespeare then, in the following dialogue, has the doctor pronounce his immortal words, exactly the opposite of what psychiatrists and the public are now say to now taught to say and think. Macbeth, how, how does your patient, doctor? Doctor, not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick-coming fancies that keep her from her rest. Macbeth, cure her of that! 
Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased, pluck from the memory of a rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon her heart? Doctor, therein the patient must minister to himself. So I thought that was interesting. I'm going to share with you, as part of the um, preface, someone who goes by the name of Ignaz Semmelweis. I don't know, has anybody have heard of him? I didn't know about this fellow until I actually started reading, um, reading this book. And I thought this was exceedingly interesting. The author writes, um, I learned about the famous 19th century Hungarian obstetrician Ignaz Semmelweis, 1818 to 1865, and his tragic fate. His stature stood and still stands in a small park in front of the city's old general hospital, not far from the gymnasium I attended for eight years. So he tells us who this person was. Semmelweis discovered the cause of perpetual childbed fever before the discovery of bacteria as causative agents of diseases. As he accurately but impolitely put it, the cause was the, was the doctor's dirty hands. Um, some of us also developed a method for preventing and preventing the terrifying epidemics of peripheral fever, endemic to mid-19th century hospital maternity wards, hand washing with chlorinated water. So the author tells us that he was moved by Semmelweis's story because what you may not know is that he shares with us the, re the discovery and the remedy by the medical pr profession inconvenienced by it and his incarceration and death in an, in an insane asylum. It taught me in an early age that being wrong can be dangerous but being right when society regards the majority's falsehood as truth could be fatal. So that's something that's for me is exceedingly um, glaring and how relevant it is in today's times. Also, for me, it gives value to the book. We're going to move on here. Diseases of the body, the author writes, have causes, such as infectious agents or nutritional deficiencies, and often can be prevented or cured by dealing with these causes. Persons said to have mental diseases, on the other hand, have reasons for their actions that must be understood. They cannot be treated or cured by drugs or other medical interventions, but may be helped to help themselves overcome the obstacles they face. I thought that was worth sharing. So also in the preface, he also talks about Roy Porter, the author also shares with us who Roy Porter was, noted English medical historian, and his book, posthumously released, Madness, A Brief History. Roy Porter writes, For says, who has continued to uphold these opinions for the last 40 years, mental illness is not a disease whose nature is being elucidated by science. It is rather a myth fabricated by psychiatrists for reasons of professional advancement and endorsed by society because it sanctions easy solutions for problem people. Over the centuries, he alleges medical men and their supporters have been involved in a self-serving manufacturer of madness by affixing psychiatric labels to people who are social pests, odd or challenging. And in this organization of stigmatization, organic psychiatrists have no less to blame than Freud and his followers, whose inventions of the whose invention of the unconscious, says alleges the author of this book, uh, breathe new life into defunct metaphysics of the mind and theologies of the soul. That sounded pretty based, but um, accurate. We're going to keep moving on here, and we're going to get right into the end of the preface. Formerly, when church and state were allied, the author writes, people accepted theological justifications for state-sanctioned coercion. Today, when medicine and state are allied, people accept therapeutic justifications for state-sanctioned coercion. This is how some 200 years ago, psychiatry became an arm of of the coercive apparatus of the state. And this is why today, all of medicine, 
threatens to become transformed from personal therapy into political tyranny. So, um, needless to say, a few pages in, I was hooked. I was hooked, and I was. It, it was. An, I knew I was going to be in for an insightful ride, and I was not disappointed. And so we're going to get now that the stage has been set. We're going to go to. We're going to go into the introduction next in this book, and that's the basic premise is it's important to understand clearly that modern psychiatry and the identification of new psychiatric diseases began not in identifying such diseases by means of the established methods of pathology, but by creating a new criterion of what a constitutes disease. To the established create criterion of detectable alteration of bodily structure was now added the fresh criterion of alteration of bodily function. And as the former was detected by observing the patient's body, so the latter was detected by observing his behavior. This is how and why conversion hysteria became the prototype of this new class of diseases, appropriately named mental to distinguish them from those that are organic and appropriately called also functional in contrast to those that are structural thus whereas in modern medicine new diseases were discovered in modern psychiatry they were invented paresis was proved to be a disease hysteria was declared to be one so, so this is what i really like about this book you've got all these kind of this subtle distinctions that are being explicit this is what has to, this is what i mentioned earlier that it, this this digging up of the implicit information that's almost being presented or that is being presented from this this enterprise the psychi psychiatric enterprise it's being presented as one thing but really there's a lot more to do with it than meets the eye and um it's awesome. It's awesome that the author gets into that. So, moving along. Now we're going to go into chapter one. Chapter one, Charcot and the problems of hysteria. You get introduced to a guy named Charcot. Jean Martin Charcot, 1825 to 1893. He was a neurologist and neuropathologist. We need to pay attention to him because he helped pave the way for what the author calls the beginning of the modern study of so-called mental illnesses, and secondly, because it contains what he, the author, regards as the major logical and procedural error in the evolution of modern psychiatry. He makes the following distinctions. He writes... The point is that the prestige of the scientist, whether of Charcot or of an Einstein, can be used to lend power to its process possessor. He then may be able to achieve social goals that he could not otherwise attain. Once a scientist becomes so engaged, however, he has a powerful incentive to claim that his opinions and recommendations rest on the same grounds as his reputation. In Charcot's case, this meant that he had to base his, ca his case about hysteria on the premise that it was an organic neurological illness. Otherwise, if hysteria and hypnosis were problems in human relations and psychology, why should have anyone taken Charcot's opinion as authoritative? He had no special qualifications or competence in those areas. Hence, he has openly acknowledged that he was speaking about such non-medical matters he might have encountered serious opposition. So that's telling of a few things. Moving on, chapter 2, Illness and Counterfeit Illness, starts to ramp up in speed of the author's dissection of the psychiatric enterprise. We can start with the author's example of a brief history of what the physician would do when confronted with counterfeit bodily illness. Unless you think every form of suffering is an illness, a theme that's also, or a question that's also explored in this book. You don't think that, do you? Okay, just checking. The author writes, What will the physician do when confronted with counterfeit bodily illness? 
The physician's behavior in this situation has varied through the, through the ages. Today, too, his reaction depends heavily on the personalities and social circumstances of, by, of both doctor and patient. So let's explore some of these that, about the, that the author brings up. <clears throat> the first one, so the physician may, may react as a policeman confronted by a counterfeiter. So this was a usual response before Charcot, when hysteria was regarded as a patient's attempt to deceive the, doc the doctor. <clears throat> it was as if the patient had been a counterfeiter who wanted to pass his worthless bills to the physician. So accordingly, the doctor's reaction was anger and, his and a desire to retaliate. Another way would be that the physician may react as a pawnbroker who try who trying to avoid <clears throat> loaning money on paste jewelry behaves as if all his clients wanted to cheat him. A pawnbroker refuses to lend money on imitation jewelry. Similarly, the physician may refuse to treat the so-called hysterical patient. He sends him away, declaring, as it were, I treat only genuine bodily illness. Do not tr I do not treat fake hysterical illness. Okay. Now we got number three. Number three is the physician may react by re redefining illness and treatment. That is, by changing the rules of the original medical game. And that is what Charcot began and Freud perfected. Under the, new, under the old rules, illness was defined as a physico-chemical disorder of the body, which eventually manifested itself in the form of a dis disability. When disabled, the patient protected, and if possible, treated for his illness, and he was usually excused from working and from other social obligations. On the other hand, when a person imitated being ill and disabled, he was considered and called a malingerer and was to be punished by the physicians and social authorities alike. Under the new rules, the attitude toward this latter group, or at least toward many members of it, was redefined. Henceforth, persons disabled by phenomena that resembled bodily diseases were, but were not in fact such diseases, in particular so-called hyster hysterics, were also classified as ill that is, mentally ill, and they were to be treated by the same rules that applied to persons who were bodily ill. So the author starts to dig deep. He says, I maintain, therefore, that Freud did not discover that hysteria was a mental illness. He merely asserted and advocated that so-called hysterics be declared ill. The adjectives mental and emotional and neurotic are semantic strategies to codify and at the same time conceal the differences between two classes of disabilities or problems in meeting life. One consists of bodily diseases, which by impairing the function of the human body as a machine creates difficulties in social adaptation. The other consists of difficulties in social adaptation not attributable to a malfunctioning machinery, but on the contrary, inherent in the purposes the machine was made to serve by those who built it, i.e. parents, society, or by those who use it, individuals. Here we go. Here's more about our friend Freud. The author says, Freud and the psychoanalyst create a created a new system of psychiatric classification, especially with respect to hysteria and malingering. The concept of malingering, too, was retained, but it was redefined as the conscious imitation of illness. Classes B and B, hysteria and malingering, were thus distinguished by whether the patient imitative behavior was unconscious or conscious. Right, so, so there's a lot of trickery going around here, uh, which is important to note. A lot of deception. The, the author here shares with us this part to build on it. This is why, in part, the concepts of hysteria, neuroses, and mental illness have come to be used in an increasingly capricious and strategic rather than consistent and descriptive way. Typical is Freud's assertion that there are people who are complete masochists without being neurotic, end quote. Of course, Freud never explained which masochists are neurotic and which are not. <laughs> so there's also some humor in here as well, because it, there's just, it, it gets, it's, this is funny. Some of these things that are rather absurd and it's because of their level of absurdity, it's actually comical. So that's a lot of fun. Okay, chapter three explores the social context 
of medical practice. So that's, that's what the chapter is called. And it has to do with things like private therapeutic relationships as something desirable. And this shouldn't come as a shock that it's desirable because there can be, as the author points out, connections between illness, disability, and shame, and between shame and privacy. That's interesting. So what would cause one's actions to be so dreadful in shame that to even talk about it, they would prefer and pay someone top dollar to listen to them and their problems. What are you in fact doing that's so shameful? What have you done in the past that's so shameful? Maybe that's a, maybe there's a reason that you feel feels shame for such action or actions. That's because shame has a foundation of the element of morality to it. It has to do with what's right and what's wrong. And modern medicine still can't answer that, but instead provides false solutions or tricks or numbs you of your shame, but never fully relieves you of your shame. Because there's more to it. There's more to it shame and morality here that cannot be satiated by men and their conceptions alone. But I digress. The author adds, in addition, privacy and secrecy in the therapeutic situation are desirable and necessary also to protect the patient from real, that is, social rather than emotional harm. The author explains, in this connection, such possibilities as syphilis in a school teacher, psoriasis in a cook, or schizophrenia in a judge should be kept in mind. These, however, are merely illustrative examples. The possibilities, both reward and penalty, for publicly established diagnoses are virtually limitless. The precise character of the rewards and penalties will vary once again with the moral, political, and scientific character of society. So that's an interesting connection there. There's a feedback there, right? We're all aware of it. We're all living it. But now we're going to get into some political history. Some political history is definitely peppered into this book. And it's fascinating because you get to learn so much. And that's why we're here. We're here to learn. I'm going to talk about, yes, an author named Mark Field who wrote and studied on Soviet socialized medicine. That was his book. And he writes in it, It is perhaps significant to note that the Hippocratic Oath, which was taken by Tsarist doctors as it was in the West, was abolished after the revolution because it symbolized bourgeois medicine and was considered incompatible with the spirit of the Soviet medication. The Soviet doctor, on the other hand, is proud of the fact that he actively participated in the building of socialism. He is a worker of the state, a servant of the people. The patient is not only a person, but a member of a socialist society right? Communism. <laughs> so the author builds on, the Hippocratic Oath was abolished, I submit, not because it symbolized bourgeois medicine, for charity practice is as much a part of bourgeois medicine as private practice, but rather the oath tends to define the physician as an agent of the patient, right? That's an important distinction. And I'm glad he pointed that out. Has anybody here heard of the Doctor's Plot of, 1983, of 1953? I almost said 83. It definitely was in 83. The author here tells us about it. The famous Doctor's Plot of, the, of early 1953 lends further support to the foregoing interpretation. It was alleged then that a group of highly placed physicians, for good measure, many of them Jewish, had murdered several ranking Soviet officials and were also responsible for Stalin's rapidly declining health. After Stalin's death, the plot was branded a fabrication. So nothing new here, right? But I did a quick little follow-up on Britannica.com just for point of reference because I'd never heard of it. 
Here's what it is. I'll save you a quick trip looking it up yourself. Doctor's Plot, 1953. Alleged conspiracy of prominent Soviet medical specialists to murder leading government and party officials. The prevailing opinion of many scholars outside the Soviet Union is that Joseph Stalin intended to use the resulting doctor's trial to launch a massive party purge. Okay, so, you know... Nothing to learn here. Just the usual political fun and games. People murdering each other for power. Moving on. Chapter 4 is called Broy and Freud's, and Freud's Studies on Hysteria. So basically diving more into the trickery Freud employs. What did, what did Freud write? Let's take a look. The author puts together the following frame. In other words, Freud assumed and wrote as if everyone who consulted him as a patient were a patient. He thus failed to ask... Is this person, is the person sick? And asked instead, in what way is he or she sick? His observations were thus systematically misdescribed as the following excerpt illustrates. A highly intelligent man was present while his brother had an ankylized hip joint extended under an anesthetic. At the instant at which the joint gave way with the crack, he felt a violent pain in his own hip joint, which persisted for nearly a year. The further instances could be quoted in other cases. The connection is not so simple. It consists only in what might be called a symbolic relation between the precipitating cause and the pathological phenomenon, a relation such as healthy people form in dreams, for instance, a neuralgia may follow upon mental pain or vomiting upon a feeling of moral disgust. We have studied patients who used to make the most copious use of this sort of symbolization. That was Freud. So once again, the author ascertains. Freud speaks here in a language that is, that is a complicated mixture of object and meta-languages, of things one can observe and of things one cannot. For example, it is possible to observe a person who vomits or, is in, or who is in pain or is disgusted, but it is impossible to observe a person who has mental pain or feels moral disgust. He goes on. Further, Freud speaks of neuralgia when he really means like neuralgia. The former implies that the person has some sort of neurological disease, a disorder of his bodily machinery. The latter implies only that the pain resembles neuralgia and may or may not signify the presence of a bodily disease. The author writes, Brewer and Freud approach hysteria as if it were a disease essentially similar to physico-chemical disorders of the body, for example syphilis. The main difference between the two was thought to be that the physico-chemical co -chemical basis of hysteria was more elusive and hence more difficult to detect with the methods then available. Hence, investigators had to content themselves with pursuing psychological methods of diagnosis and treatment until discovery of a physico-chemical test of hysteria and its appropriate organic treatment became available. Chapter 5. And in addition to picking up speed, the author starts to just drill you with information and insight. The author writes, This passage is from a paper from Leon Saul, characteristically titled, quote, A note on the psychogenesis, psychogenesis of organic symptoms. Some psychogenic organic symptoms, such as a tremor or blushing, are the direct expressions of emotions and conflicts, while others are only their indirect results. Examples of the latter are A. The effects of acting out, such as catching cold from throwing off the bedclothes during sleep. B. The incidental soreness of an arm due to a due to an hysterical tremor. So the author right away goes to work. A sore arm, he writes, a hysterical tremor and the common cold are here lumped together. Each member, each a member of the class called psychogenic organic symptoms. A sore arm is a complaint. It might be a lie. A hysterical tremor is a psychiatric inference. It might be an organic tremor. And the common cold is a microbiological inference. It 
might be a bacterial infection or an allergic reaction. He writes, Although it is a part of the unquestioned and an unquestionable dogma of psychosomatic research to call all these phenomena organic symptoms, I maintain that these are not organic symptoms. Indeed, that there are no such things as organic symptoms. A sore arm, as I have remarked, is a complaint. A tremor is a sign, and a common cold is a disease. If a sore arm is organic merely because it involves a body, then everything that people do with their bodies, from playing bridge to making love, is also called organic. And if all these things are psychogenic because they are preceded by some sort of conduct to which they might be related, then every illness is psychogenic, as every illness could be shown to be related to some antecedent act. In short, psychogenic organic symptoms like mental illness are phrases which are the products of linguistic misuse palmed off on the public as the products of psychosomatic research. Okay. So here we're playing with fire. That's what's in this book. Fire. Move on to chapter 5, Language and Proto-Language. So basically what we're talking about here is manipulation of language as a tool to further one's claim whether it's genuine or not. In chapter 6, Hysteria is Communication. He builds off the foundations he sets in chapter 5. And I'm going to point something out in particular. He writes, Because so-called psychiatric problems have to do with difficulties which are, by their very nature, concrete human experiences, presentational symbolism lends itself readily to the expression of such problems. Human beings do not suffer from Oedipic complexes. Human beings do not suffer from sexual frustration or pent-up anger as abstractions. They suffer from their specific relationships with parents, mates, children, employers, and so forth. I thought that was good. In chapter 10, we get to the ethics of helplessness and the help helpfulness. The author discusses certain scriptural passages, particularly the Beatitudes. Maybe you've heard of them. So the Beatitudes, in case you, were, you don't remember what they were, they included things like, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the pure of, in heart, for they shall see God. Here's what he had to say about this. The author writes, It is implicit in these biblical rules of helplessness that the disabled may regard their weakened status as prima facie, evidence of merit which must be rewarded by the appropriate theological, medical, or psychiatric interventions. In the hysterical transaction, disability is used as a coercive tactic to force others to provide for one's needs. It is as if the patient were saying, You have told me to be disabled, to be stupid, weak, and timid. You have promised that you would then love me and take care of me. Here I am, doing just as you much have told me. It is your turn now to fulfill your promise. The author writes, Much of psychoanalytic psychotherapy may revolve around the theme of uncovering exactly who taught the patient to behave in this way and why he accepted such teachings. It may then be discovered that religion, society, and parents have conspired as it were, to inculcate this code of conduct, even though it is so tragically ill-suited to the requirements of our present social conditions. Again, again, this book came out in the 70s, and that's how relevant this book is uh, to our times. Now we're going to talk about someone named Herbert Spencer. And for that, the author will teach us, in his words, one of the thinkers who first recognized the moral implications of illness and treatments, which we have been considering, and who noted especially the problems which rules favoring disability might pose for a society, was Herbert Spencer. Spencer was considered one of the founders of a modern sociology, the author writes, was profoundly concerned with the problem of helping the helpless, and he was influenced by Darwin's evolutionary biological ideas. The author writes, Spencer insisted that men can no more flout this 
law of nature, that's, that's what Spencer believes, than can animals. While he thought it necessary and therefore proper that children should be sheltered by their families, he felt strongly that a similar arrangement with respect to adults would bring disaster on the human species. In the true spirit of rugged individualism, Spencer pleaded for the self-reliant responsibility of man as opposed to the ministrations of the paternalistic state. The author writes, Surely none can fail to see where the principle of family life to be adopted and fully carried out in social life. Were reward always great in proportion as desert was small fatal results to the society would quickly follow. And if so, then even a partial intrusion of the family regime into the regime of the state will be slowly followed by fatal results. So what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about it, and the author tells us, the regime of the family group with the regime of that larger group formed by the adult members of the species. At some point in their lives, mature animals are left to themselves to fulfill the requirements of life or to perish. Spencer writes, now there comes into a play a principle just the reverse of that above described. Throughout the rest of, lo- of its life, each adult gets benefit in proportion to merit, reward in proportion to desert. Merit and desert, in each case, being understood as ability to fulfill all the requirements of life to get food, to, sh- to secure shelter, or to escape. Enemies. Placed in competition with members of its own species and in an antagonism with members of other species, it dwindles and gets killed off or thrives and propagates according as it is ill-endowed or well-endowed. Chapter 11 was fun. Chapter 11 was called, it's called Theology, Witchcraft, and Hysteria. What the author describes, In this chapter, I shall try to show that today the notion of mental illness is used to chiefly obscure and explain away problems in personal and social relationships, and that the notion of witchcraft has had been used in the same way during declining Middle Ages. Most people accused of witchcraft were women, the author writes. The word witch, witch implies woman, as did the word hysteric. Janet and Freud, it will be remembered, were pioneers in asserting that they were that there were male hysterics. In this respect, the parallels between being a witch and being hysteric are striking. According to the author had previously mentioned someone else's work, Perinder, out of 200 convicted witches in England, only 15 were men. He interprets this as a sign that women are persecuted minority in a world ruled by men. Now, the author here makes an important footnote in regards to Janet and Freud and how they had asserted that they were such a thing as male hysterics. This is what they had to say. Footnote, I should say, on it. The discovery of male hysteria, like Charcot's conversion of malingers to hysterics, was another step in the democratization of misery. Freud was obviously more eager to acknowledge equality between the sexes in regard to their susceptibility to neuroses than in regard to their potentialities for creative performance. His assertion that men may too suffer from hysteria must be contrasted with his equally firm conviction. So that's especially insightful, I'm sure. Chapter 12 was awesome. It's called The Game Playing Model of Human Behavior. It has a lot to do with John Piaget, the Swiss psychologist known for his work on child development, and well, the games we play, the social games. In this chapter, he also talks about values. The author writes, I have long considered lying as one of my of the most important phenomena in psychiatry. Freud was especially critical of the deceitful habits of both physicians and patients with respect to sex and money. This is the gist of Freud's recollection of his encounter early in his medical career within the Viennese obstetrician gynecologist Trobeck. Trobeck had referred a patient to Freud, a woman who, because her husband was impotent, was still a virgin after 18 years of marriage. The physician's moral obligations in such cases, so Schorbeck told Freud, was to shield the husband's reputation by lying about the, the patient's conditions. 
I, I mentioned this case only to show that lying on the parts of both patients and physicians was an important issue in psychoanalysis from its very inception. Indeed, I believe that certain psychoanalytic concepts came into being in order to deal with the idea of lives, for example, the unconscious and hysterical conversion, and that certain psychoanalytic arrangements came into being in order to deal with the management of lies, for example, free association and the psychoanalytic contract. So the conclusion, he once again highlights the importance of the relevance of morality. The author writes, I have argued that today the notion of a person having a mental illness is scientifically crippling. It provides professional assent to a popular rationalization, namely that problems in living experienced and expressed in terms of so-called psychiatric symptoms are basically similar to bodily diseases. Moreover, the concept of mental illness also undermines the principle of personal responsibility, the ground on which all free political institutions rest. The author writes, Human behavior is fundamentally moral behavior. Attempts to describe and alter such behavior without at the same time coming to grips with the issue of ethical values are therefore doomed to failure. Hence, so long as the moral dimensions of psychiatric theories and therapies remain hidden and inexplicit, their scientific worth will be seriously limited. He writes, In the theory of personal conduct which I have proposed, and in the theory of psychotherapy implicit in it, I have tried to correct its effect by articulating the moral dimension, dimensions of human behaviors occurring in the psychiatric contexts. In the epilogue, he offers the following. Modern man seems to be faced with a choice between two basic alternatives. On the one hand, he may elect to despair over the lost usefulness or the rapid deterioration of games painfully learned. Skills acquired by diligent effort may prove to be inadequate for the task at hand almost as soon as one is ready to apply them. Many people cannot tolerate repeated disappointments of this kind. In desperation, they long for the security of stability, even if stability can be purchased only at the cost of personal enslavement. Does any of this sound familiar? The author writes, The, author, the other alternative is to rise to the challenge of the unceasing need to learn and relearn and to try to meet this challenge successfully. Isn't that interesting? Interesting and relevant and timeless. This is what's here in this book. Let's keep moving on. He writes, I've tried to avoid the pitfalls of obscuritanism, which by beclouding these problems fosters discouragement and despair. We are all students in the metaphorical school of life. Here none of us can afford to become discouraged or despairing. Yet in this school, religious cosmologies nationalistic myths, and lately psychiatric theories have more often functioned as obscurinist teachers misleading the student than as genuine clarifiers helping him to help himself. Bad teachers are, of course, worse than no teachers at all. Against them, skepticism is our sole weapon. Isn't that true? So finally, in the summary... He provides a complete synopsis of the authors of his arguments. The ones that resonated with me the most are as follows. 1. Strictly speaking, disease or illness can affect only the body. Hence, there can be no mental illness. Okay. 2. Mental illness is a metaphor. Minds can be sick only in the sense that jokes are sick or economies are sick. 3. Psychiatric diagnoses are stigmatizing labels, phrased to resemble medical diagnoses and apply to persons whose behavior annoys or offends others. 4. Those who suffer from and complain of their own behavior are usually classified as neurotic. Those whose behavior makes others suffer and about whom others complain 
are usually classified as psychotic. Mental illness is not something a person has, but is something he does or is. Number six, if there is no mental illness, there can be no hospitalization, treatment, or cure for it. Of course, people may change their behavior or personality with or without psychiatric intervention. Such intervention is nowadays called treatment. And the change of it, if it proceeds in the direction approved by society, recovery, or cure. At the end are the two aforementioned appendixes. And in it is especially interesting because you get to find out a little bit more about the author and kind of a follow-up. So he writes, By 1970, I became a non-person in American psychiatry. The pages of American psychiatric journals were shut to my work. Soon the very mention of my name became anathema and was omitted from new editions of text that had previously featured my views. In short, I became the object that most effective of all criticisms, the silent treatment. Or, as the Germans so aptly call it, Toshvega tactic. All right, well, that's going to do it for this book review. Thank you very much for coming in and stopping by. It was great to see you. Don't forget to like, subscribe. That way you can keep up with my next book reviews. Let me know what you think in the comments. And if you're feeling generous, down in the descriptions below is a link to donate and support the channel. All right, well, that's going to do it. See you next time.